All right, hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Timothy Vreeland. I am the vice chair of the education committee with the, within the ACS CSSP, and we are very excited to bring uh, the first in what we hope to be a series of webinars around the technical standards of cancer surgery. Um, the first of these webinars will be on uh, the pancreatic code duodenectomy or Whipple operation. So we have a great panel of five talks today. Next slide. Couple of logistics before we get started. Uh, the way Go to Webinar works is everyone will be automatically be muted. You will not be able to ask questions or unmute yourself, but you can ask questions in the chat box. So here, as you see on the screen, there's a little question box. You can type your questions in there. My co-moderator and myself will be uh, fielding those questions. We will save the questions till the end, but we do plan to have like a half an hour discussion. Uh, so please add questions in there because we really do want to get audience par participation here. Uh, and just so you're aware, this will be recorded and on the ACS Learning Management System within a couple of weeks. So please tell your friends. Uh, you can watch this at a later date. Now, so again, we're we're excited to have this this webinar where you know our committee has really been charged with talking about COC standards and the new COC standards around cancer surgery. Uh, and we've spent the last year and a half or so really trying to get the word out about those, but we're sort of hoping to move on a little bit, not that we won't focus on the, the COC standards as well, but we really wanna get back to the core principles of the textbooks that uh, the ACS has put out around cancer surgery. So today we're gonna start that off. We're gonna do that around the Whipple operation. The objectives here are to recognize the key operative uh, standards for performance of a pancreatic duodenectomy endorsed by the American College of Surgeons Cancer Research Program and the CSSP to understand the evidence-based rationale for these standards and describe the technical aspects of the operative standards. Next slide. So to get there, we have five talks planned. Uh, we'll talk about radical lymphadenectomy. We'll talk about division of the unsinate process from the SMA. We'll talk about reconstruction, uh, resection and reconstruction of the SMD portal vein to obtain negative margins. We'll talk about evaluation of extra pancreatic uh, disease and assessment of local regional tuber anatomy and resection to negative margins at the pancreatic neck, neck and bile duct. So we will uh, introduce each of the speakers as we go through the different talks. Next slide. So again, our moderators, myself, and then uh, my co-moderator, Dan Nelson from William Beaumont Army Medical Center. And then next slide, our five panelists, as we showed briefly, and again, we'll uh, introduce each talker uh, or each speaker as we go. So without further ado, our first speaker, is Dr. Susan Tsai, who is a professor in the Division of Surgical Oncology at the Department of Surgery at Medical College of Wisconsin. She serves as a director of the LeBon Pancreatic Cancer Program and the leader of the GI disease-oriented team in the, in the Cancer Center. She also serves as the chief, chief of hepatobiliary surgery at the Clement Zablocki VA Hospital. Uh, so Dr. Tsai is gonna be talking to us about evaluation for extra pancreatic disease and assessment of local regional tumor anatomy, which most of us think is kind of the first steps of the Whipple operation. Dr. Sai, take it away. Thank you. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, thanks to the CSSP for supporting this webinar and to Dr. Nelson and Reland for organizing and moderating this session. Um, I think my charge was to discuss staging laparoscopy as it relates to pancreatic duodenectomy, and this has been identified as a technical standard. Um, it's recommended that staging laparoscopy be performed prior to a laparotomy to evaluate for the prep, <clears throat> excuse me, for the presence of radiographic, radiographically occult metastatic disease. And in doing so, this allows for a direct inspection um, of the peritoneal surfaces or the liver, especially for lesions that are less than five millimeters in size, which may be really at the limit of detection for um, CT or MRI. And obviously, if metastatic disease is discovered, then patients are spared a laparotomy that has no curative uh, intent. So the recommendation for staging laparoscopy is largely based on retrospective data, and that's summarized in the table that's shown um, below. Uh, the, although it's based on retrospective data, the strength of the recommendation is quite strong. So in the literature, the positive laparoscopy rates you can see range from 4 to 20 percent, and it's important to note that the yield of diagnostic laparoscopy is really inversely related to the quality of the CT scan. So in other words, a staging laparoscopy will be high yield if you have a non-contrast or a single-phase contrast CT scan with thick image um, acquisition. Um, in contrast, if you have a thin slice multi-detector dual-phase CT scan, the yield of a diagnostic laparoscopy may be lower. Um, next slide. 
So in 2016, a Cochrane review was performed to evaluate the diagnostic accuracy of laparoscopy following CT scan in patients with pancreatic and periampillary tumors. And the figure on the left summarizes how the study determined the test positivity, uh, which was based on histologic confirmation of metastatic disease, which was either um, performed at the time of diagnostic laparoscopy or later at the time of laparotomy. And in total, as you can see on the uh, consort diagram on the right, 16 studies were included, um, and those studies range from 1986 to 2014, so quite a long range of time. Uh, next slide. The review concluded that the addition of diagnostic laparoscopy to CT imaging uh, decreased the probability of discovering unresectable disease in patients um, from 41% down to 20%, so that's a significant decrease. And all the review, although the review was performed over a long time period, um, even in the later studies, multi-detector uh, helical CT was associated with a high uh, false um, negative rate, um, and in some cases were as high as 63%. So both the table on the left and oh sorry, <laughs> both the table on the left and the figure on the right summarize the value of diagnostic laparoscopy in relationship to a pretest probability based on CT imaging alone. And maybe if we just concentrate on the figure on the right, if there was no relationship between pretest and post-test probability, it would be a straight one-to-one -one, um, line. Um, but with the addition of diagnostic laparoscopy, what you can see is that the curve actually bends towards pretest probability, indicating that there is some additional value um, with the addition of uh, diagnostic laparoscopy. And if you look at the figure on or the table on the left, if there's a low pretest probability, and um, in here uh, the, the minimum is 17%, the probability then in the post test setting is 7%, so there's a significant increase there. And that benefit is even greater if the pretest probability is, is even higher. Um, the authors also did conclude that the complications related to diagnostic laparoscopy were exceedingly low, less than 0.2% in the studies that they um, observed. Uh, next slide. So although staging laparoscopy is universally recommended, there are some clinical factors that are associated with higher rates of positive diagnostic laparoscopy. And those, um, this is a study that summarizes 24, 24 uh, retrospective studies that utilize staging laparoscopy in patients with resectable pancreatic cancer. And in this, in this study, the factors that they observed that were associated with higher rates of positive diagnostic laparoscopy were a high CA-19-9, uh, and at this, um, in this value, uh, it was greater than 150, tumors greater than three centimeters in size, and um, in this and other studies, primary tumors involving the body and tail were also associated with a higher rate of uh, diagnostic laparoscopy being positive. Next slide. So despite the potential benefits of diagnostic laparoscopy, many surgeons um, still proceed directly to laparotomy without laparoscopy. And this is a recent study by Tevia Sachs and Jennifer Sang that looked at the trends in the use of diagnostic laparoscopy in patients with pancreatic cancer um, using the NISQIP database. And this is over the time frame from 2005 to 2013. In total, over 17,000 patients were included, and they evaluated the type of operation which was performed. So 81% of those 17,000 patients were resected, eight received a palliative bypass, 16 had laparotomy without resection, and then uh, 12 had a diagnostic laparoscopy alone. Among the 81% of patients who were resected, only 10% had a diagnostic laparoscopy performed prior to resection. And um, it's in interesting also that over time, although rates of uh, resection are increasing for patients with pancreatic cancer, the utilization of diagnostic laparoscopy appears to be decreasing. And you can see that in the dotted, um, both the solid and the dotted lines in the figure on the left. You can go to the next slide. Um, so the main advantage of a staging laparoscopy may be to facilitate, facilitate the delivery of subsequent systemic therapy for patients for whom curative surgery is not possible. Um, this is a study uh, performed at a single institution by uh, Christina Ferroni and colleagues that looked at uh, their experience of over 1,001 um, um, pancreatectomies for pancreatic cancer, and these were patients who were taken to the operating room who did and did not undergo resection. 
of the 1,001 patients, 151 um, at the time of surgery were found to have metastatic disease, and almost 50-50, 59% had diagnostic laparoscopy and 41% had laparotomy without uh, diagnostic laparoscopy. They then uh, proceeded to compare these two groups, and um, the patients who underwent laparoscopy were one, more likely to receive subsequent chemotherapy, 60% compared to 42% among the laparotomy uh, group. They were also more likely to start chemotherapy sooner at an average of 18 days versus 40 days. And then the median um, overall survival for those who received laparoscopy versus laparotomy was 11 versus eight months. Next slide. Um, so to review, I think um, the technical standards of the diagnostic laparoscopy maybe are not as exciting as what you'll see later on in, in the hour, but in a brief review, um, the port sites are recommended to be aligned with the planned uh, laparotomy incision. Um, it, the recommendation is to use a 30-degree scope uh, to inspect all peritoneal, diaphragmatic, hepatic, and portal uh, surfaces that are visible, and then biopsies are recommended to confirm metastatic disease when necessary. Next slide. So I think um, in my remaining just minute or so, I just wanted to touch on a, a couple controversial areas uh, for future directions and future studies. One is the timing of diagnostic laparoscopy, whether it's done at the time of diagnosis, um, after the conclusion of chemotherapy or neoadjuvant therapy uh, in the preoperative setting, or if it's done at repeated or serial um, uh, time points. So I think that is, is yet to be um, uh, agreed upon. Uh, performing, um, I think at my institution, performing the diagnostic laparoscopy at the time of curative resection has some advantages. First, that there's a single anesthetic and in a single surgical procedure. Um, uh, that I think the disadvantage, obviously, is that you worry that um, you may may not be able to do peritoneal cytology, which will come up a little bit later as, um, as an alternative. So certainly that's a little bit more challenging to do at the time of a, a planned surgical procedure. Um, the rates of di positive diagnostic um, cytology or laparoscopy um, can vary uh, depending on when um, the the uh, procedure is performed. So, um, and I'm sorry, there is a typo here. For the diagnostic laparoscopy performed at the time of diagnosis is approximately 50, is positive in approximately 15% of patients. And with neoadjuvant therapy, there is um, a decrement in that. And in our experience at MCW, um, following neoadjuvant therapy and radiation, uh, we have usually a 5% positivity rate. Next slide. Um, and then finally, with peritoneal cytology, again, it's not surprising that um, peritoneal cytology, the rates of which increase with increasing stage, um, and that's shown in the table uh, table one at the bottom of the slide. Uh, the median time to progression in these patients who have positive peritoneal cytology is actually quite short, so it's 7.7 .7 months, and systemic progression, not even uh, within the peritoneal cavity, but at distant sites occurs in 74% of patients, so it is really a harbinger of metastat uh, aggressive metastatic disease. Um, and in general, patients with positive peritoneal cytology have a poor survival, ranging from 12 months to up to 24 months if they have a little bit more localized, locally advanced disease with peritoneal cytology, depending on whether uh, consolidated radiotherapy can be included. So um, in general, these patients should be considered um, uh, a lot along the lines of having metastatic disease. And I think that is my last slide. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Matthew Katz. Uh, he's the professor and chair of the Department of Surgical Oncology and holds the Lockton Distinguished Chair in Pancreatic Cancer Research at the University of Texas and the Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. And Dr. Katz will be reviewing division of the unsinent process from the superior mesenteric artery. Thanks very much. Um, so um, the technical standard for SMA dissection uh, as espoused in the, um, in the operative standards for cancer surgery manuals is very specific about uh, the conduct of the SMA dissection. And basically what it says is that um, the dissection should be a periadventitial dissection of the superior mesenteric artery from the level 
of the first regional branch of the superior mesenteric vein caudally uh, to the takeoff of the superior mesenteric artery from um, the aorta. There's honestly not a lot of hard data to recommend um, upon which, uh, you know, to, to justify this recommendation. Um, but there's a fair amount of theory behind it and, and, and a fair amount of secondary evidence um, that that doing this um, uh, sort of um, dissection is, is critical. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the theoretic basis for this standard uh, and then um, demonstrate how, how we perform it here at MD Anderson. There's clearly a lot of ways um, that the uh, that the SMA dissection can be can be accomplished. Um, I don't claim that this is uh, the right one, but it's it's the one we use. I think it's it's pretty uh, simple to perform. Um, so to start, um, I want to emphasize that it's it's important in pancreas cancer. We think it's important at any rate uh, to perform a margin negative uh, resection when we do when we do pancreatic cancer operations. And certainly, this is one of the primary things. Um, that the uh, surgeon has under his or her control. Um, when we look at uh, series or trials uh, performed over the past 30 years, and these are several representative studies, when you compare patients who have undergone an R1 or R2 resection to patients who have undergone an R0 resection, um, patients who um, have uh, undergone a complete microscopic or macroscopic resection uh, do uniformly worse as a group than, than those who have undergone a complete resection. Um, they have uh, uh, more uh, higher rates of, of recurrence and um, uh, shorter uh, durations of overall survival. So we, we say that at least a macroscopically complete resection and probably a microscopically uh, complete resection to the extent that is possible is important to, uh, in, important to these patients. Next slide. So when we're talking about margins, uh, the AJCC uh, looks at really three margins in the United States, the common bile duct margin, the pancreas uh, transection margin, typically at the neck, um, and the superior mesenteric artery margin, the tissue uh, that lies between the unsent process of the pancreas and the superior mesenteric artery. And if you look at any series in which um, posit margin positivity rates uh, in, at each of these margins, is um, classified, uh, you'll see that um, rates of a positive common bile duct or pancreatic transection margin are pretty low. And the reason for that, of course, is that you can always, if you, if you test those margins intraoperatively with immediate histopathologic analysis, you can identify a positive margin and then be resect potentially to a negative margin. Um, in the case of the SMA margin, though, that's not possible as long as you're taking all of that tissue uh, between the unsynthetic process of the pancreas and the superior mesenteric artery, um, uh, there's nothing to re-resect except the artery. And I, I'm not sure if Mark Trudy is going to talk about SMA resection, but clearly that's not a, that's not a standard approach. Um, so, so really, the, the operation is all about um, uh, achieving a negative uh, SMA margin. The reason why that's difficult um, is because microscopic cancer cells can infiltrate from the uncinate process towards the superior mesenteric artery, even in cases when the tumor looks um, anatomically resectable on CT scan. And on the left, you can see a couple of tumors which um, appear to be well away from the superior mesenteric artery. There's an intervening fat plane on the top one and an intervening fat plane and intervening normal pancreas on the bottom, both of which um, you know, both of these tumors are, are anatomically resectable, and you might think that you could get away with a, with a um, you know, perhaps a sub suboptimal dissection in each of these cases. But in each of these cases, a periadventitial dissection of the superior mesenteric artery was performed with a transection line um, depicted there in the red. And in both of these cases, there were cells um, at, the, at the margin, at the ink, or within one millimeter of the ink. So, you know, to the extent that you had positive margins here when you did this procedure, uh, this type of, of periadventitial dissection, you might expect even higher rates um, if, you're, if you're dividing through that soft, that soft tissue. Next slide. So, you know, really this is, is more or less the whole operation is this tissue between the uncinate process and the superior mesenteric artery. Um, and, um, performance of the operation 
um, really uh, needs to take into account um, how best to access this tissue, expose this tissue, and then um, clear this tissue from, from the artery. Uh, next slide. So how do you do that? Well, first you trust the scan because clearly you're not gonna clear an artery of all of that tissue if the artery is encased in tumor. And in that type of situation as, as shown on the right, um, you know, that's an unresectable cancer um, and an R2 resection is extraordinarily likely in that particular situation, at least in the absence of, of, uh, of preoperative therapy. Um, on the, on the, in the middle and on the left, you can see situations in which the um, uh, periadventitial dissection might be, uh, might achieve a, um, a, uh, a microscopically negative margin. So, so really you have to trust the scan and judge the potential for um, a, micro, a microscopically, macroscopically complete operation before you go into the operating room and have a strategy for, for dealing with the SMA uh, once, once you get there. Next slide. It's also important, I think, to have a really deep understanding of the relevant anatomy and relevant um, radiology uh, prior to uh, actually performing uh, the, uh, the operation. And actually, we have our surgical oncology fellows um, draw out the uh, surgical anatomy prior to every case to make sure that they understand every, every, uh, every piece of the relevant, uh, the relevant operative anatomy. Next slide. So the first thing I think to understand uh, um, with respect to the SMA dissection is uh, the anatomy of the venous system because it'll show, at least in the, the technique we use, um, the uh, uh, SMA, uh, pardon me, the SMB really uh, has a, the, the ability to which you can access the SMA uh, relies on, um, relies on uh, how you mobilize and, um, deal with branches of the superior mesenteric vein. So we start by understanding the proximal venous system as the, as the superior mesenteric vein courses under the neck of the pancreas and understanding the uh, anatomy of the gastrocolic uh, trunk um, as well as the middle colic vein. Typically, uh, you know, both of these are, uh, are divided in the course of the operation, certainly the gastrocolic trunk, but uh, often we divide the middle colic vein as well to get better access. Next slide. Also very important to understand the, um, the anatomy of the uh, first jejunal vein, uh, typically um, courses post posterior to the superior mesenteric artery um, uh, and then enters into the uh, superior mesenteric vein on the patient's right hand side to, to uh, have essentially kind of an elbow there on the right side of the superior mesenteric uh, vein. Um, little small little um, unsinate branches uh, drain into that superior mesenteric vein when it's in a posterior position. That's that's most common. There's also a, a, a variant where the um, the first adrenal branch is, uh, is anterior that occurs approximately 40% of the time. Um, we typically, or I typically at least, don't don't start the SMA dissection until I have control of of, of those branches. Next slide. Uh, also important to understand uh, the location and the uh, uh, appearance of the uh, uh, IPDAs um, and their configuration with respect to the superior mesenteric artery, so you know when uh, when they will be encountered. Most of the time, they enter the superior mesenteric artery um, as a uh, common trunk with the first jejunal artery. Um, they can also um, uh, occur with other configurations, either directly off the SMA or as a combination. Next slide. So uh, the way we typically do the um, SMA dissection. In, one way to do what the what the operative standard uh, espouses um, is to retract the superior mesenteric vein and the portal vein to the left to expose all of that tissue um, uh, to the left to the right of the superior mesenteric artery and then dissecting directly on the superior mesenteric artery uh, using whatever you know technique you want um, from the level of the first jejunal vein to the superior mesenteric um, arteries take off from the aorta. I think it's particularly helpful to um, dissect out the um, anterior and posterior hepatic arterial lymph nodes to really uh, to uh, uh, to show where the um, takeoff of the SMA is. We'll hear later about the uh, value of that dissection from an oncologic perspective, but from a technical perspective, I personally think it's really helpful. Um, next slide. 
Um, so, uh, and if you can press play, this is uh, the way uh, that um, operation is done. Uh, this is using a minimally invasive approach. This is my uh, partner, Naru Akoma, doing this uh, robotically. I'm only showing it robotically to show that we, we would do the same type of, um, you know, technique, use that same technique, whether or not we're minimally invasive or, or maximally invasive. Um, uh, you know, the same, the same rules apply with respect to lateral retraction of the superior mesenteric vein, um, getting on the superior mesenteric artery, dissecting carefully out the um, IPDAs, in this case, uh, as a confluence with the first adrenal artery, um, dividing those directly on the superior mesenteric artery, and then marching up the superior mesenteric artery towards the um, towards uh, towards its towards its takeoff. Here, Naru is uh, dividing that IPDA, uh, munch munch munch, and then uh, dissecting there on the lateral border. And you can begin to see the uh, the right lateral aspect of the superior mesenteric artery there. And once he gets on that into that plane, um, then he'll just continue the dissection. Um, cephalad, there's the SMA better exposed um, and him dissecting uh, deep to that structure. So again, um, really getting on the superior mesenteric artery and taking all of that tissue to the right of it. Um, you, can, you can go to the next slide. You can advance. Yeah. So in that case where the tumor is not involving the blood, the SMA or the confluence, you can retract the vein to the left, but there are many situations in which the tumor um, is adherent to the superior mesenteric uh, vein, and you can't retract the vein to the left. Um, it doesn't make that superior mesenteric artery dissection any less important. In fact, perhaps it makes it even more important. And therefore, the same kind of care that went into that superior mesenteric artery dissection um, in, in that first approach has to, be, has to be given here, even though you can't retract the vein to the left. There are many, many approaches to the superior mesenteric artery um, in this type of situation. A lot of people use a, a posterior approach. I personally use an anterior approach. I think it's the way, you know, I think at least. Um, it's, it's the way many surgeons think. It's the way scans look. And I think it's really easy to understand. The only um, issue with this type of approach is that you often have to divide branches as they course, uh, venous branches as they course over the superior mesenteric artery. Um, that may be the superior mesenteric, uh, pardon me, the inferior mesenteric vein like this, um, when, it, when it drains into the superior mesenteric uh, vein directly as opposed to the splenic vein, or for example, the first adrenal vein when it's in that, in that anterior configuration. But in situations like this, for the most part, you can divide those veins without any problem. You can even divide the splenic vein typically without a problem. Um, and that really gets you on to um, the, the right lateral aspect of the SMA, so you can do that dissection. Um, next slide. So here's a cartoon of that. Uh, again, I start typically by um, doing a hepatic arterial dissection, including all of the nodes anterior and posterior to the, to the artery. Irrelevant whether that makes a difference oncologically. I think it, it's, it's helpful um, to maintain safety and allow me to do a good SMA dissection. Um, you can and that's that tissue in that yellow box. And then um, in this particular cartoon, um, the, IM, the anterior draining IMV and the first adrenal vein, which is draining anteriorly, have both been divided. Actually, the splenic vein's been divided here too. But you can see what that does is give you a nice view of the, of the right lateral aspect of the superior mesenteric artery, and then you can come right on it. I'm certainly not uh, recommending or suggesting that the, S, uh, that the um, Splenic vein needs to be um, divided in every case, or or even many cases, um, but it's it's uh, it can be really useful, um, and I'm a and I'm a fan. Um, next slide. So here's uh, the open uh, technique uh, showing that um, you can see uh, cephalad that we've cleared out all of those tissues um, around uh, anterior and posterior to the hepatic artery, which is looped in red. The splenic artery is looped in blue, and the portal vein is looped in blue. Um, we're dissecting there along the superior mesenteric artery, exposing um, the tissue anterior to it. And then once that tissue is identified, dissecting directly on the right lateral aspect of the superior mesenteric artery, you can see that the direction of the dissection is really clear because we've dissected out those hepatic artery um, nodes and all that tissue in advance. Um, then you can, you know, dissect out the um, 
IPDAs. Here's one here. And I think this is Tim Greenland operating actually. Um, uh, those, are, those are dissected. You can see the SMA very clearly. All the anatomy is very clear. And again, all this, all this requires is coming down directly on the, on, the, on the artery. So I think it's a very safe approach uh, to doing the dissection that the um, Operative Standards for Cancer Surgery uh, uh, um, uh, recommends. Um, I think that's it. So, is that my last slide? Yeah. So, um, that la I think that last video, uh, in particular, um, Tim Vreeland uh, um, made a made a really nice, I think, uh, video on the SMA dissection, which is uh, viewable on YouTube. Um, and uh, again, I think this is one way um, you can do that technical aspect of the operation. But the key again is is exposing that right lateral aspect of the SMA, whatever way you feel comfortable doing it. But I think this is a a, a pretty uh, straightforward way uh, to do it that makes it safe um, and guarantees that you'll you'll really have good access to that to all of that tissue. So I'll, I'm happy to take any questions at the end. But thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, present. All right, great. Thank you, Dr. Katz, for that great talk. Uh, next talk will be uh, Dr. Sai Ahmed. Dr. Ahmed is the director of the University of Cincinnati Cancer Center and a professor of surgery at the UC College of Medicine. He is going to talk to us about radical lymphadenectomy. So, Dr. Ahmed, take it away. Thanks, Tim. I want to, uh, again, thank Dr. Vreeland and Dr. Nelson for putting this webinar together uh, and for the uh, other uh, speakers, you know, really an all-star panel. I was asked by uh, Tim and Dan to talk about the role of lymphadenectomy for pancreas cancer. And we all know the slide. Uh, we know that pancreas cancer has a high incidence of both systemic disease and local regional recurrence. Um, and in even in tumors where on imaging, the tumor appears limited to the pancreas and all the lymph nodes look normal on imaging, oftentimes on pathology, we'll have a high incidence of lymph node positive disease. Um, and even when the lymph nodes are negative, if we really investigate those patients and look at the lymphatic pathways in the retroperitoneum, oftentimes we'll find tumor deposits within the lymphatic pathways that haven't yet gotten to the lymph nodes. So we know that spreading via lymphatic pathways and uh, into the lymph nodes is a, uh, uh, a problem in pancreas cancer with high incidence. If you look at local regional recurrence, a uh, paper by um, the Hopkins group demonstrated that uh, although most patients have systemic disease, in, in addition to local recurrence, there is a subset of about 20% of patients that only have local recurrence. Again, um, highlighting the importance of lymphatic clearance to control local recurrence. Next slide. So the question really is, what's the role of lymphadenectomy uh, in patients with pancreas cancer? And really, the three things that people talk about the most is first and foremost, staging and prognosis. Second is local regional control. And there's a thought that perhaps lymphadenectomy may also uh, um, contribute to improved survival. And we'll talk, look at the data regarding this uh, in this talk. Next slide. So the first really is staging and prognosis. And this is a series from the Heidelberg Group um, where the authors evaluated over 800 patients over a 10-year period. And in this study, both the number of lymph nodes as well as the lymph node ratio were strong predictors of long-term survival. In, in the study, the authors demonstrated the median number of lymph nodes evaluated at 24 and showed it, um, a linear relationship with the number of lymph nodes and survival. So patients with one lymph node uh, positive had a median survival of 31 months those with two to three lymph nodes, 26 months. And then when you get to over eight lymph nodes, the survival fell to 18.3 months. And if you look at the subset of patients who had node negative disease, N0, in this subset, those with more than 10 lymph nodes harvested had uh, superior survival than those with less than 10 lymph nodes har harvested, suggesting that in order to accurately stage the lymphatic basin, one had to really harvest at least 10 lymph nodes i.e. preventing stage migration. Next slide. This is a study from uh, Warshkow that looked at the SEER database, um, again, asking the question, how many lymph nodes does one really need to harvest 
um, to accurately stage the basin. <clears throat> and in this study, if you look at the graph to the left, you can see that once you get to about 20 lymph nodes, the rate of finding additional positive lymph nodes starts to fall, suggesting that you need to harvest at least 20 lymph nodes to accurately stage the lymphatic basin. When we looked at, when we, in this study, when the look, authors looked at uh, those patients with stage 1A, 1B, and 2 disease, you can see there's a direct correlation with both um, overall survival and cancer-specific survival when looking at those that had more than 20 lymph nodes and less than 20 lymph nodes harvested. Again, based on this study, need, uh, based on this study, you need to take about 20 lymph nodes to prevent stage migration. Next slide. So it's based on studies like this and others that the International Study Group on Pancreatic Surgery published its consensus statement in 2014. And in this statement, um, the ISGPS um, uh, recommended that, that in order to perform an adequate standard lymphadenectomy, one has to take at least 15 or more lymph nodes to ensure adequate pathologic staging of the disease. And we know that Harvesting 15 or more lymph nodes has also directly correlates with quality of the hospital, the quality of the operation, pathologic evaluation, and we need to, again, take 15 or more lymph nodes to accurately stage the lymphatic basin and prevent stage migration. Next slide. So again, the, the International Study Group for Pancreas Surgery has uh, recommended that a standard lymphagnectomy during a Whipple operation should remove stations 5, 6, 8A, 12B, 1 and 2, 12C, 13A and B, and the lymph nodes along the right lateral aspect of the SMA, 17A and 17B. In other words, and if you look at this figure, all the yellow circles uh, highlighted on the schema, on the schematic here, are those lymph nodes that need to be harvested during a standard lymphadenectomy. When we talk about performing a subtotal distal pancreatectomy, we're, dis we're talking about stations 9, 10, 11, uh, and 18 for a subtotal distal pancreatectomy. Next slide. So based on this, people started asking whether doing an extended lymphagnectomy can improve survival. And this was based on the Halstidian principle that lymph nodes may spread in an orderly fashion from first echelon to second echelon to third echelon, um, as it was initially thought in breast cancer. Um, and the question is, would this principle hold for pancreas cancer? Can, by removing more lymph nodes, can we improve survival for a subset of patients? Can we beat the lymph nodes by one level and cure a subset of patients? Next slide. This thought was bolstered by studies out of Eastern countries. Uh, these studies were single institution studies, non-randomized retrospective studies. But what they demonstrated was that performing a radical lymphadenectomy was in fact associated with improved survival. You can see these two studies from Manabi uh, and from Ishikawa, both demonstrating that a radical pancreatectomy, i.e. radical lymphadenectomy was associated with improved survival. But remember, these are uh, retrospective studies with significant selection bias. So it's based upon these retrospective data that Western countries started investigating this principle. Next slide. So the very first group that looked at this was uh, the group from Italy. Uh, this is a study by Petrozzoli that was published in 1998. And in this study, the authors randomized 40 patients to the standard lymphadenectomy group to 41 patients to the extended lymphadenectomy group. The standard lymphadenectomy group really removed two uh, lymph nodes along the anterior and posterior uh, pancreas, anterior and posterior duodenum, pylorus, um, as well as the proximal um, uh, portal vessels. The extended lymphadenectomy group removed those lymph nodes, including lymph nodes up to the hilum of the liver, the hiatus of the esophagus, periaortic, peri-SMA, and real, renal hilum. You can see that the groups were equally matched with regards to stage, size, grading of the tumor, and oncologic clearance. The authors, however, did not find a survival advantage to performing an extended lymphadenectomy. Now, the authors did report that there was perhaps a survival advantage in those in the subset of patients with uh, lymph node positive disease, 
But again, remember, this study was not powered to look at that. So this was a negative study. Extended lymphadenectomy did not improve survival in patients with pancreas cancer. Next study. After the study, there have been five additional prospective studies evaluating the same exact question. Does extended lymphadenectomy improve survival in, in patients with pancreas cancer? And the answer to all five studies was no. None of these studies uh, demonstrated any survival advantage performing extended lymphadenectomy. The largest of these studies was performed by Charlie Yeo uh, at Hopkins, where they randomized 146 patients to the standard and 148 patients to the extended group. Again, did not find a survival advantage to extended lymphadenectomy. Next slide. So the, the question is, do we really need to perform these randomized studies to answer this question? So if you look at the principles for defining the subset of patients that might actually benefit from extending lymphadenectomy, three things have to be true. First, only those patients with positive N2 disease can derive the benefit from extended lymphadenectomy. In other words, if you remove negative or normal N2 nodes, the patients are not going to derive a survival advantage. The second principle is only patients who undergo a margin negative resection are going to derive a benefit. If you remove some additional lymph nodes but leave cancer behind in the margins, the patient's not going to derive a survival advantage. And the last is that you can't have any metastatic disease. So if you take out additional lymph nodes in the face of metastatic disease, the patients will not derive a benefit from a, an extended lymphadenectomy. So what are these numbers? Next slide. So if we go to the literature and look at the rate of N2 positive disease, the weighted average is about 10%. So if you look at the series out of Hopkins from Germany and uh, from Dr. Katz's institution, you, you can see that the rate of N2 disease is in the range of about 10%. Next slide. What's the rate of margin negative resection? Dr. Katz has highlighted the role of the unsinic dissection in achieving this. And you can see for resectable tumors, Again, a weighted average about 82%. Even in, in, in the hands of experienced surgeons, uh, we can find uh, positive margins, um, mostly at the SMA, in, in about 15 to 20% of cases. So if we look at the series uh, that I've highlighted here, the weighted average here is 82% margin negative resection rate. Next slide. So what's the, what's the role uh, or the incidence of, of those patients who have N2 positive disease, but no metastatic disease. And that really, the only way we can extrapolate this number is looking at long-term survivals on, uh, for patients who actually had N2 disease. And that number is low. If you have the N2 disease, most patients have systemic recurrence in the, in, and the, the rate of, of survivors living long-term is about two to 3% or weighted average about 3%. Next slide. So if you add all this together, 10% incidence of N2 positive disease, 82% incidence of margin negative disease, 3% incidence of M0 in the face of N2 positive disease, and you multiply that by 100, you can see that theoretically only 0.25% of patients would, would benefit from an extended lymph node dissection just based on the biology of pancreas cancer. So the whole role in the whole question of whether or not we should do an extended lymph node dissection really is, is based on the biology and these these six randomized studies that were done really didn't account for this and was treating this like other cancers where extended lymphadenectomy has also been investigated. Next slide. So in conclusion, the number of positive lymph nodes and lymph node ratio remain strong prognostic indicators for survival and outcomes. We know that increased lymph node harvest is associated with improved staging. Prevention of stage migration is a reflection of the hospital and surgical quality. An extended lymphadenectomy offers no survival advantage and is associated with increased morbidity. Next slide. In conclusion, for a Whipple, a standard lymphadenectomy should include 15 or more lymph nodes and should be performed as indicated by the International Study Group, harvesting stations 5, 6, 8A, 12B12, 12C, 13A and B, the lymph nodes along the right lateral aspect of the SMA, 17A and 17B, and for distal, stations 9, 10, 11, and 18. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Ahmad, for that excellent talk. Um, I just want to remind our audience we're accumulating some good questions here. I uh, just want to encourage the audience to, to continue to submit those so that uh, we can uh, discuss them when we uh, have our panel discussion at the conclusion of these talks. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Mark Trudy. He joins us from Mayo Clinic, where he's a professor of surgery in the pancreas, the uh, practice chair in the Division of pa uh, Paddlebillary and Pancreatic Surgery. And uh, Dr. Trudy is going to be discussing the resection and reconstruction of the superior mesenteric vein and portal vein to obtain negative margins. Thank you, Dr. Trudy. Thanks for having me, everyone. Uh, next slide, please. So I've been charged with discussing uh, resection of the portal superior mesenteric vein uh, during pancreatectomy. Next slide. Uh, as Dr. Katz and Dr. Ahmad alluded to, one of the few things that we do have uh, evidence for in pancreas cancer surgery is the importance of margins. Patients that undergo a positive margin resection can have up to a 50% reduction in their overall survival. So how common is it that we have a positive margin? Next slide, please. So here are the results of randomized controlled trials, adjuvant trials, and resectable pancreas cancer. In the five of these, the average positive margin rate was about 30%, with a similar uh, quarter of local recurrence. Well, how could that be? These were all done at major centers. They all had good pancreas surgeons, and they all had very strict radiographic inclusion criteria to be truly resectable. So why is there still a high percentage of patients who undergo a seemingly good technical operation that have a positive margin? Next slide. Well, our pathologists have known uh, the reason for this for many decades. It's the pathognomonic hallmark of pancreatic adenocarcinoma is it's microscopically infiltrative away from the tumor. It's this extra pancreatic extension that we really don't realize. There's a significantly high rate of adjacent organ invasion, much higher on final pathologies than on preoperative imaging. As Dr. Ahmad uh, noted, nodal metastases are present in over 50% of patients. And despite a curative R0 resection, a high percentage of patients have associated lymphovascular and perineural invasion that is associated with local recurrence and a worse survival. And finally, these tumors uh, have a tendency for major vascular infiltration, and hence the, the purpose of this talk today. Next slide. So the only oncologic contribution we have as surgeons to the patient is to provide two things to provide a safe operation and an effective operation. Effective meaning it needs to be potentially curative, and the only reason we're in the operating room for that patient is to prevent a local recurrence, and that is likely gonna be a surgical quality indicator moving forward. Now, the standards suggest that an unblocked venous resection uh, should be performed if necessary for an R0 margin. Next slide, please. So what's the anatomy that we're talking about? As Dr. Katz pointed out, you have to have a real thorough mastery of the portal mesenteric venous system, and not simply the portal or SMV or splenic vein, but we need to understand all the associated uh, inserting branches. We need to know the coronary vein or left gastric vein, its variable insertion, the IMV where it inserts two thirds of the time into the splenic vein, one third into the SMV itself, and the further down we go on the SMV, every patient is very different. It could be very complicated. And the further down you go, the thinner the vein becomes and more difficult to manage. Next slide. In 1951, this was the first report of a segmental SMV resection for pancreatic adenocarcinoma performed at the University of Minnesota by George E. Moore, who happened to also uh, go on uh, later on to lead the Roswell uh, Park Cancer uh, Center. And this was a futile attempt. So I'm going to be presenting some initial data. The, all of this is retrospective. Uh, there's been hundreds of uh, small case reports and case series. I'll be showing some of the, the best data, starting from single institution centers uh, to more uh, meta-analyses. Next slide. So it wasn't until 50 years later that one of the largest series at that time came out of Houston. They looked at 110 uh, Whipple patients who went to an unblocked venous resection. They had a matched comparator of no venous resection. Three quarters of these were segmental uh, venous resections, and they found that it had a similar 30-day mortality, but those that underwent venous resection had higher blood loss, higher length of stay, and also had a higher R1 uh, margin rate despite the venous resection, but they found no statistical difference in survival between venous resection and not. Next slide. It wasn't until a decade later we had the next largest series out of the UK, 240 uh, vein resections. They had also a matched comparator. All of these were Whipples. 
These were equally distributed between lateral or segmental resections. They also found a similar 30-day mortality, higher blood loss, higher length of stay. They also found higher positive margin rates, and they showed identical survival between venous resection or no venous resection. Next slide. The Italians in 2016 published the largest series at that time, 406 venous resections. In this study, there was not a non-venous resection comparator. Most of these were Whipples, equally distributed between lateral or segmental resections. They did report the uh, incidence of formal histologic invasion, which was nearly 60%. And they did report a somewhat elevated 30-day mortality of 7% uh, and a 28% positive margin rate. And in that study, they did show that histologic invasion was the single largest predictor of survival in those patients. Next slide. The group out of the Netherlands uh, did a similar matched cohort, 139 venous resections. Again, these were all Whipples. Uh, these were more lateral resections and segmental. They also reported a greater than 50% histologic invasion rate, longer OR times, higher EBL, and higher positive margin rates. And they did show worse local regional failure as well as overall survival in those that underwent venous resection, uh, but only showed this on univariate analysis. Next slide. And finally, this is the most recent largest single institution study published to date. This is the group out of Heidelberg, a very prolific group, six, almost 700 venous resections. They had a matched comparator of almost 1,600 non-venous resections, a combination of Whipples and totals. Majority of these were segmental resections. They did find a significant worsen 90-day mortality with venous resections, as well as a significantly high margin positive rate, which is actually present in both groups, uh, but that group specifically does have a more thorough margin assessment. They found that venous resection was associated with the worst survival uh, when they even looked at R0-only patients. Uh, however, they did meet the threshold of a two-year survival uh, with an R0 resection with venous resection. Next slide. Uh, do we have any larger data sets? Well, this was published about a decade ago, a nationwide inpatient sample, 400 venous resections. Of note, they did include 40 arterial resections in this specific study. Most of these were Whipples, equally distributed between type of resection, higher EBL, higher morbidity, similar mortality. There was higher uh, mortality in the high volume centers. This was thought to be because these were the arterial resections included. They also noted an increasing frequency of venous resection over that 10 year period, almost a tenfold jump. Next slide. And shown here is the best data that we have, a series of five meta-analyses and systematic reviews over a 15 year period, looking at anywhere between 19 and 50 studies, uh, several thousand uh, total patients, uh, anywhere from 700 to 2,000 venous resection patients. So what were the conclusions as a whole? Those that underwent venous resection tumors tended to be larger. Vascular invasion was reported in four of the five studies, about 60%. Uh, th four studies showed a higher posit positive margin rate when they underwent venous resection, longer OR time, higher EBL. One study showed higher morbidity. Uh, two studies showed an increased mortality with venous resection, and there were a couple studies that showed decreased survival. Some showed no difference, and there were a variety of other uh, subset analyses showing histologic invasion was worse, and one meta-analysis even looked at cost effectiveness. Next study. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the principles of venous resection? Like anything in vascular surgery, you need not just proximal and distal control, but for pancreatectomy, you also have to control these lateral of branches. You have to have adequate quality vessel in terms of wall thickness, diameter. The further down you go on the SMV, the thinner the wall and less likely it is to hold sutures. You have to have minimal tension on your anastomosis. You have to have good flow dynamics uh, after the reconstruction. And the ultimate goal is we need to reconstitute both mesenteric and gastrosplenic outflow and liver inflow. Failure to do this either intraoperatively or postoperatively is going to result in significant signs and symptoms of venous hypertension, such as postprandial pain. These patients can develop brisk GI bleeding. They can almost look arterial because of the high pressure. They can get swelling of their mucosa and develop malabsorption and diarrhea. If, the, if it's a significant occlusion, they could develop ascites and move on to liver insufficiency. Next slide. 
So what are the types of venous resection? The most simple type is a lateral resection, shown here as a type one or type two. This could be a simple lateral resection with primary venorophy, as long as it involves less than 20 to 30% of the circumference. Uh, those that involve more than that, but less than 50%, it's typically some form of a patch venoplasty. Second type is a segmental resection with end-to-end -end anastomosis, either of the portal, the SMB, or the confluence. And the third type is a segmental resection with an interposition graft, again, at various sites. Uh, notice on these pictures of uh, the anatomy of the splenic vein uh, that has to be considered. We'll talk about that briefly later on. And we'll show some examples of each. Next slide. So a lateral venorophy is something that was done often. I, I rarely do this now. Uh, typically because of the, the likelihood of leading to a significant stenosis. Uh, if it does require a venorophy, I typically close this transversely to avoid a stenosis. Next slide. Most commonly, it's some sort of a patch venoplasty. You could use an autologous vein patch. Many people use pericardial bovine uh, patches. Uh, we've actually moved away from that. We found those bovine pericardial patches tend to shrink. Uh, and lead to stenosis, and we're doing more PTFE patches because the PTFE uh, gives a little bit extra structure and holds that vein open over time. Next slide. Uh, segmental resection with end-to-end -end anastomosis uh, can be accomplished even with relatively long gaps uh, once the specimen is removed. Uh, you know, people have described bringing together a five to six centimeter gap as an end-to-end, -end, but obviously it depends on uh, the patient anatomy. Next slide. Uh, and those patients who cannot be put together as an end-to-end, -end, they require an interposition graft. This could be an autologous uh, vein, could be a cadaveric graft or a synthetic graft. Next slide. A variety of autologous vein grafts have been used, saphenous vein, internal jugular, a deep femoral vein as shown here on the left, and then our preference is the autologous left renal vein graft. Next slide. We have significant experience with the left renal vein graft. It doesn't require a separate incision. Uh, the, the vein is right there available. It's an adequate size and, and durability. And as long as you preserve the uh, gonadal and uh, lumbar branches from the left kidney, uh, typically that left kidney has no consequence. It has excellent drainage as shown here. We've recently described our experience with no long-term occlusions, great long-term patency, and minimal uh, kidney damage uh, from such a graft. Next slide. Uh, this is just uh, illustrating graphically, you know, how this is done. Uh, white coker maneuver, taking all the lymphatic tissues, a side biting uh, clamp on the cable end, and a TA staple on the renal end. If you need extra length, you could ligate uh, the left adrenal vein and then angle that TA stapler that gives you one to two centimeters longer. Next slide. And this is showing just an intraoperative picture of how we harvest these grafts. The cavotomy is subsequently closed, and then we use this as the conduit. Next slide. Uh, we have an increasing experience with these cryopreserved uh, cadaveric graft. You could use an SFA, an iliac, or even aortic homograft. Uh, these are quite expensive, uh, but can be utilized uh, because they're relatively new. We don't have much long-term data. Next slide. Synthetic grafts or PTFE sometimes have to be used if you don't have any adequate uh, conduits. Uh, however, these have been associated with higher thrombosis rates as well as infection and typically used as a last resort. Next slide. Uh, what's the data on graft types? Well, this is the best data we have, a systematic review published a couple years ago. Uh, and they found that cadaveric grafts actually had the lowest rates of earlier overall graft thrombosis, followed by autologous vein grafts. And the, the worst conduits were the synthetic grafts. I'm not sure if I would put cadaveric at the top. I, 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 my experience is autologous and cadaverics are similar, but I would agree that the synthetic grafts do have a, a much higher rate of complications. Next slide. At one point, these pericardial tube grafts were the rage, where you create a custom graft over a chest tube. Every single one of these grafts that we've done, we've done about two dozen, have occluded and have led to mortality. Uh, next slide. We wouldn't recommend these. Uh, some authors have uh, uh, advocated for a peritoneal or falciform patch or graft. I have zero experience with this, but they have been described. Next slide. Uh, and there are new conduits coming forward, uh, you know, off the shelf biological conduits. Unfortunately, there's no data uh, in the use of the, the pancreatectomy as of yet. Next slide. 
The question has to do uh, here, if you're doing a pancreatic head resection and you're resecting the confluence, if the IMV drains into the splenic vein, you could simply ligate that splenic vein and your gastrosplenic outflow goes down that IMV and then back up your reconstruction, no issues. But if your IMV is resected uh, as part of your confluence resection, you can have significant sinistral hypertension uh, that could lead to you know, gastric varices and bleeding. So how do you deal with that? You could simply transpose the renal vein onto your reconstruction. That's simple enough. However, if there's a problem at this reconstruction, now you have problem with both gastrosplenic and mesenteric outflow. The alternative is a distal splenorenal shunt where you transpose down that uh, transected splenic vein onto your left renal vein as long as you're not using that for a conduit. Next slide. Uh, some authors have suggested a mesocable shunt in patients who have complete occlusion of their portal SMV confluence with these massive dilated collaterals. Operating in such a setting can lead to life-threatening hemorrhage. Uh, although so this has been described, uh, people talk about it. I don't think it's done uh, very often. Uh, next slide. An alternative is something we've done more of is using preoperative portal venous stenting. So here's an example of a patient with a pancreatic uh, head neck tumor with complete obstruction with dilated collaterals. Next slide. We send them to IR. We see the transhepatic venogram. We could see a complete obstruction. More often than not, they could snick a wire across that obstruction into the distal SMV. You see all those collaterals. Next slide. A stent is employed and all those collaterals literally disappear. Next slide. And now you could do a much safer resection with the segmental vein resection taking the stent out. In this case, we used a cadaveric graft. Next slide. Uh, finishing up here, venous reconstructive complications, occlusion, thrombosis, stenosis. These can be an intrinsic problem to the reconstruction or an extrinsic problem. Uh, they're associated with the type of reconstruction, any associated complications such as leak or infection. There is higher rates of uh, complications with preoperative radiation therapy. And as patients are living longer, we're starting to see complications arise as before uh, they tended to, 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 to have metastases and die before these problems. We recommend an earlier rather than a later intervention. We use our interventional colleagues with uh, quite generous uh, portal venous stenting with or without thrombolytics. The one thing uh, our experience has shown us that you need to drain any associated collections prior to placing a stent, otherwise you're gonna have a significant problems. Next slide. And the final question is, do we need to anticoagulate these patients? Uh, every group has a different uh, guidelines. Uh, this is the only data we have, a systematic review showed no difference in mortality, morbidity, bleeding or reoperations with or without anticoagulation. No difference in thrombosis rate, whether you did it or not. However, uh, if you did have an early venous thrombosis that was associated with a high mortality, uh, thus in our practice, we do tend to anticoagulate in general because of those risks. Final slide. So in conclusion, uh, the evidence does support an operative exploration and resection in the presence of a reconstructable portal SMV axis. Venous resection can be indicated as long as an R0 is technically feasible with reasonable risks. They are associated with higher complexity and greater morbidity and mortality. And aside from some lateral and simple segmental resections, more of the more complicated uh, resections should be limited to centers with experienced surgical and multidisciplinary teams. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Trudy, that was excellent. Um, I think it, they, that was very fast. We'll have some questions for sure at the end. I think a lot of people are interested in how you do these things. Um, our final speaker is Dr. Alice Way. Dr. Way comes to us from Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. Uh, she's a co-director of surgical initiatives at the David M. Rubenstein Center for Pancreatic Cancer Research. She's the associate program director of the uh, fellowship there, and she's an associate professor of surgery at uh, Weill, Weill Cornell School of Medicine. Dr. Way is going to talk to us about resection and negative margins at the pancreatic neck, at pancreatic neck and bile duct. Uh, I'll let you take it away, Dr. Way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vreeland. And next slide, please. So what I'm going to say is maybe sounds a little bit counterintuitive given all of the discussions that we've had so far. But really, you know, we've talked a lot about margins. And so the question is, do you have to resect for negative margins? And so re the recommendations from the technical standards are that the pancreas should be divided at the neck of the gland. And if not, if that's not possible, to the left of the gland. 
The bile duct should be divided close to the junction of the common hepatic duct and the common bile duct. Um, and that the transection should really occur at where the tissue is grossly normal. Whether or not you do intraoperative assessment of these margins and re-resection should be considered, but it's not considered obligatory, particularly if you have to take much more duct, um, much more normal pancreas. And just the level of uh, data, and I'll go through some of it, is primarily retrospective and low level. And the level of uh, strength is weak. Next slide, please. Now, you've actually heard several people talk about the importance of negative margins. If you listen carefully to Dr. Katz and Dr. Ahmad and, and Dr. Trudy, you'll see that everyone hedged a little bit about the importance of margins. And that's really because it's surprisingly, chal um, it's a, that the data is a little bit more nuanced than we think. So, you know, what we know is the critical point is that we should aim for R0 margin. However, proving whether or not an R0 margin uh, are R0, R1 direct or R1 indirect uh, imp improve survival, it has been surprisingly challenge, uh, challenging to demonstrate, and there are reasons for it uh, that are beyond the scope of today's discussion. But if you, uh, uh, if you look at the recurrence-free and overall survival with R0, and I should say some studies, but not all studies, have demonstrated a clear improvement. And if you look at the slide on the... Um, the screen there uh, that you can see this is from the SPAC3 study, large multicenter study uh, that looked at asthma therapy. You can tell that of the 1,151 patients that R0 direct, that's in the pink line, impacted survival. But if you look at R, uh, R1, um, excuse me, R0 imp improved survival, R1 direct, which was in baby blue, and R1 indirect, which is less than one millimeter, which the AJCC 8th edition is now uh, considered a positive margin. Uh, neither of them clearly demonstrated improved survival. Next slide, please. And um, you can see, and uh, you can see there, that's the slide that just demonstrates that. Next slide. And, and the reason, and in terms of the frequency of the margin involvement, this is the same SPAC paper. Uh, can you hit the tab, please? Next slide. You can see that the most commonly positive margin is the unstained posterior margin. And in this study, you can see the R0 uh, rate for the medial side was only 43%, and the positive margin at the posterior with the, uh, was only uh, was 43% as well. So both uh, the unstained, the posterior margins, and this is probably a little bit of a slippery slope on how you define it, were both the most likely to be positive. Next slide, please. And the least likely positive margins were actually the pancreatic transection margin was only positive in 9% uh, in, um, uh, of patients. And if you look at the bile duct margin, is rarely a problem in, bile duct, in uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Next slide, please. And, and the reason I, that this is important is that the, the quality of the margins um, has a lot to do with this quality of the pathology. And it's very important at your institution to use a standardized pathologic assessment and, and know what that is, uh, that um, how, you, the, how the specimen is grossed, how it is marked, uh, the expertise of the institution and the pathologist to read it really affects highly whether or not the margins are positive and, or negative. And this probably impacts the retrospective data that we have that looks at the relationship between survival and margins. And uh, it really, the adequacy of the technique, so if you look at a very high quality technique where you uh, um, look very carefully at all the margins, perhaps up to 85% of patients will actually be reclassified as R1. So that um, at this time, what we really advocate is a formal assessment of the surgical margins, how it's done matters. It should be marked as um, shown on the slide there with the anterior and posterior surfaces, as well as the SMA surface. Um, which and and the SMV surface. Next slide, please. And and there are various uh, techniques that this is done. So you should know what your pathologist is doing. At our institution, we use a bread loaf technique, which is shown on the uh, screen left. Uh, whereas the Leeds protocol, uh, which is a very detailed cross-sectional method, um, is done in a cross-sectional way. And the Leeds method has been shown to be uh, associated with higher R one margin calls. Next slide, please. 
I'm um, just going to briefly talk about the bile duct. As we know, in ductal adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, it's a rarely a problem that we typically will divide the common hepatic duct near the junction of the cystic duct where the tissue is grossly normal. Uh, typically, the common hepatic duct is also chosen because it's less likely to stenose due to the inflow of um, and vasculature of the biliary system. For cholangiocarcinoma, if you're doing a Whipple for distal cholangiocarcinoma, you can um, modify this a bit, and I do modify this a bit. I side much higher on the common hepatic duct near the confluence, um, and there may be a role uh, beyond this talk about a frozen section in that particular situation. So that's a little bit more nuanced for distal cholangiocarcinoma. Next slide, please. I want to concentrate mostly talking about the uh, pancreas uh, margin. Next slide, please. In terms of the, the pancreas duct, where should you divide it? So you really should divide it at least at the neck or further to the left where the tissue appears grossly normal. It can be challenging to assess that because there may be atrophy or pancreatitis. So how do you choose where the pancreas parenchyma is grossly negative? This is probably the most important decision, trying to get the margin negative on block initially. So you, you know, a combination of preoperative imaging, uh, post um, intraoperative palpation, looking at changes in the diameter of the pancreatic duct, really should be dilated, should be beyond where the tumor is. And of course, parenchyma changes that are associated with Tumor can be difficult to distinguish from distal obstruction or atrophy, but really integrating all of those changes with a pate where is beyond the beyond the um, tumor is important. Though in some patients, as we all know, none of the parenchymal uh, parenchyma is actually normal. Next slide, please. So whether or not we should uh, do it in an intraoperative assessment, probably if you um, poll the panel and the audience here, there'll be a split on who does it. It should be considered, but as part of the technical standards at this time, it's not considered obligatory. And um, part of that is that the data is really mixed on the utility of frozen section for pancreas ductal adenocarcinoma and its impact on recurrence-free and overall survival. Next slide. On the pro side, Advocates will say, well, this is a modifiable risk factor. You can always take more pancreas, or when you can take more pancreas, why not take more margin in order to achieve negative margins? And it's relatively safe. Um, some patients, uh, some institutions will advocate for a total, and I think uh, that would we can discuss whether or not they use utility in that. On the con side, the feeling is that frozen sections uh, with a well-chosen initial margins that the positive margin may reflect tumor biology, so more aggressive disease rather than truly a measure of surgical quality. And also that there are issues with the ability of the frozen section pathology to make the correct call at the time due to changes related to pancreatitis or atrophy. So it may be challenging to get an accurate assessment intraoperatively. Next slide. If we look at the evidence, so uh, it is as mixed as I said, it's if you look at the largest study from the Central Pancreas Consortium, uh, of which some of the members of today's panel are on that consortium. Uh, uh, next slide, please. You can see that uh, um, they looked at 1,399 patients. And if you look on the screen right, you can see that there are patients in whom the frozen section was R0 and the permanent section was R0. Those patients had a survival of 21 months OS, uh, uh, whereas the patients who were converted, so frozen section had R1, had more resection, and the permanent section was R0, only had a survival of 12 months, very similar to the patients in whom uh, the permanent section had no frozen section and the permanent section was R1. On the other side, there is the second large, another large study uh, looking from MGH and the University of Verona, so combined the European and American large study, looked at patients with a similar um, with a similar scenario, looked at the patients who were frozen section R0, so they were negative on frozen section and negative on permanent, and they had a survival of 31 months. Of the patients in whom were frozen section showed a, a positive margin, and more uh, tissue was taken. And in this study, about 28% or 45 patients and actually had a total in order to obtain negative margins. In those patients who had frozen section converted to negative mar uh, R0, R1 
frozen section converted to R0 permanent sections, they had a survival rates that were 28 months, uh, which is uh, which is similar to people who were initially frozen section R0. And those patients who persistently were R1 only had a survival of 21 months. So this group advocates for routine frozen section, though probably there is some difference between the groups. If you look at the central pancreas consortium, that the patients had fewer of them had um, preoperative chemotherapy, they had larger tumors, and in the patients from Verona and uh, Massachusetts General, uh, they, some of those patients actually had intraoperative radiotherapy for at-risk mothers. So it's really difficult to do a head-to-head -head comparison, but th at this time it's not clear, and so therefore it's not obligatory that you should uh, re-resect or check frozen, sorry, check frozen sections and re-resect on the basis of those results. Next slide. And I went through these a little bit, in de but just to show you a little bit of detail, if you look at this study from MGH and University of Verona, large study, 986 patients that frozen sections that were at the pancreas neck, 20% were initially frozen section positive, of which 16% uh, was then converted to R R0, and there were four that were persistently R1 on permanent sections. As I mentioned, 45% of these patients went on to total pancreatectomy, and you can see from this slide, I think you can hit this button for a second. Yeah, you can see there from that that if you looked, if they were, um, if they were complete resection on block, so at the initial, at the first time, it was 28 months, it was 24 months if it was complete resection not on block, so re-resected for more tissue, and then if they were persistently uh, incomplete resection, it was 19 months. Next slide. And next slide. If you, and this is the Central Pancreas Consortium, so that was 1,399 patients at eight centers, um, of which patients were 75% were rendered R0 on permanent section. There was 11% of them, so less that were considered R1 by frozen section. And if you look at the 72 patients that were converted from R0, R1 to R2, that there was no, uh, there was no improvement in their survival. Next slide, please. And of course, oops, uh, and yes, yeah, so they, um, if you look at the patients, um, if you look at the additional resection, so this is a specific um, slide looking at patients who were re-resected uh, for frozen section margins, they did not improve their survival. So patients who were R0, uh, persistent R0 versus uh, uh, persistent R1, sorry, permanent section R0, permanent section R1, and converted that there was no substantial improvement. So in this, group, uh, you know, this feeling is that really that margin positivity is a marker of tumor biology and really question the utility of routine frozen section. Now, as we start to do more neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and this group only had about 7% with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, it may change our recommendations over time, but this is the current data that we have. Next slide. So, you know, these are the challenges that we face, and these are the considerations as you do this at your center, is really the logistic considerations of the pathology and the ability to assess accurately margins if you're going to do frozen sections. What's the experience of pathology? What's the availability of the pathology? What is your accuracy of frozen sections? So I apologize for that little typo there. How, what's your false negative and false positive rate at your own institution? And remember, inflammatory changes can be very difficult, may be present and may be very difficult to discriminate. So itis is difficult to uh, um, discriminate from tumor. Uh, Chemotherapy-related changes may also be more difficult. And of course, um, some of the inflammation and cancer can also coexist, really adding to the challenge of intraoperative assessment. Next slide. I'm going to just speak briefly about IPMN. It's beyond the scope of today's conversation, but um, for frozen section in the IPMN scenario may be slightly different, and that you know there may be a role for those patients um, uh, who have um, high-grade dysplasia or invasive cancer. I'll leave it at that. If you have questions, you can ask us about that. Next slide. And I, I think really the take-home message and all of the um, talks that preceded me, I think really uh, hone in on this. It's R0 permanent margin is very important for oncologic outcomes, we believe. How to get there, whether or not frozen section changes the assessment, is really the challenge. Probably the best thing to do is have, be very considered about where you make your initial divisions, be considered about the posterior and the unstate margin, because that's where it's going to be positive. Use the techniques that were discussed before to avoid the possibility of a positive margin. And of course, 
you can modify and use frozen sections for different tumor types, different clinical scenario, as I mentioned, distal cholangiocarcinoma, IPMN, et cetera. Next slide. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll welcome everybody back. Thank you all for your, your time and your talks. That was a, a master class in, in Whipple surgery. It was fantastic. Um, we do have a, a ton of questions that came in from the audience. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and uh, kick it off. Um, Dr. Katz, uh, this question comes from Dr. Wang. He, he was asking, is there any uh, increased risk for a Kyle leak? after uh, peri-adventitial dissection along the SMA. And um, uh, if you know your rates, that would be uh, particular to his question and how you manage it. Yeah, that's one of the few rates I actually don't know off the top of my head in terms of my particular or you know my center's particular Kyle leak. We've never looked at that uh, question uh, specifically, although it would probably be interesting to do it. I can tell you that it's not infrequent. Um, and we do have, we do have, um, uh, we do have Kylie's uh, now and then, um, and you know, I guess I would say that I've never, I've never, we, we've, to my knowledge, we've never really had one that was um, not managed, uh, you know, rather, rather effectively with, with, you know, MPO, low fat diet, that kind of thing. Um, so I don't consider it really a, a contraindication to this approach. I have no data, and I'm not aware of any data that would suggest that. This type of uh, dissection is um, more commonly associated with a Kyle leak, although I guess you could imagine that it might be. Um, but again, I think the advantages uh, that that it confers with respect to, to 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 clearing that tissue and getting a positive mar uh, getting a negative margin uh, would far outweigh that, given the the you know just the the the, the rate at which that's a that's a, a clinically significant issue. Happy to hear what other other people think, but it, it, we certainly have Kyle leaks. Yeah, I think it's you know there's a retroperitoneal leak, and then you can have a mesenteric leak. You know the retroperitoneal ones are pretty much they seal themselves as the mesenteric ones that could be more complicated because the lymphangiogram isn't going to visualize it. I think you know if you're doing a straightforward uh, pancreatectomy without any dissection into the mesenteric root, like no vascular resection, it should be low. If you're doing a more unblocked venous resection, I think it goes higher. And if you're doing more extensive stuff, then the rates are high. You know, some of the big unblocked resections, it's almost expected to have some degree of Kylie. Mm -hmm. Well, and I would say there's more neoadjuvant therapy, chemotherapy, radiotherapy. We are seeing a change in the amount of Kyle leaks that we see and whether or not radiation sclerosis some of the uh, lymphatics and predisposes. It's hard to know, um, but uh, certainly we do see it. I think the Older data would say the rate's about 5% or less, but I suspect it's a bit higher now and probably from everything else, we're, from all, as I see Mark's hand moving, I think it's probably more like the 7 to 10 range, but I, it's not clear whether it's surgical technique or all of the other multimodality therapies that we use for these patients. And, and I'll add that, you know, the International Study Group has also classified colleagues, just like we have for post-op pancreas fistula, there's a classification system for lymphatic leaks and um, definitely, you know, more extensive lymphadenectomy, whether that's associated with, you know, more extensive clearance of the SMA or retroperitoneal dissection associated with higher rates of Kyle leak. Um, in my experience, most of these, uh, as, as uh, Matt's already alluded to, resolve with this conservative management, usually don't need to modify diet or make them NPO or put them on TPN. Most of them will just resolve with time. Um, but it highlights <clears throat> the need to be meticulous during lymphadenectomy. You know, we're sometimes very used to just taking a bovi and going through the tissue planes, but really, if you if you do see lymphatics, they need to be controlled and tied off. So uh, something that was alluded to there, um, I'm going to direct this to Dr. Sy to, to start, but you know, a lot of these standards don't talk much about neoadjuvant. And so um, when we talk about laparoscopy, you mentioned a, a single number, CA99. Do you find the change in 99 with neoadjuvant uh, directs your use of laparoscopy? Uh, and I'd be curious to hear from the panel, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are using neoadjuvant for all your, almost all your patients. Are you doing laparoscopy at the beginning, after neoadjuvant? 
Um, if you have normalization of 199 curves, are you still doing laparoscopy, et cetera? Yeah, I think it, I can just say from our institutional experience, we uh, use it universally. So every patient uh, gets a diagnostic laparoscopy prior to a planned resection. We do tend to do it as a combined case and not separate uh, in terms of staging. And we do it um, just at the end of neoadjuvant therapy. I, I, as I mentioned before, I think there's some benefits to um, and pros and cons to doing it earlier. Um, and then I also think the, it's very interesting to think about peritoneal cytology, given all that we know in gastric cancer and whether that can be extrapolated to pancreas. Um, but I don't, I know uh, Dr. Trudy might have something to share about this, um, but uh, I, I don't know that there's a lot of data out there right now for peritoneal cytology in, in pancreatic cancer. Um, happy to hear from the rest of the panel. Do you do diagnostic laparoscopy routinely before all planned resections? Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Can you guys hear me? So yes. we do laparoscopy on everyone, and we've made a shift over the last several years. Everyone gets a staging laparoscopy at diagnosis before they start any therapy. We offer the staging laparoscopy at the same time of their port placement. Uh, we just looked at our last thousand staging laparoscopies. Uh, and in a modern setting with high quality cross-sectional imaging, still 20% uh, are positive. Uh, half of those are grossly positive, either with liver mets or peritoneal mets. The other half are cytology positive. Uh, we also look at peritoneal tumor markers, and we're doing a study on you know, KRAS, mutant KRAS in the peritoneal fluid. That's still yet to be uh, defined, uh, but that's something that we offer initially. Interestingly, Suzanne, you showed that the the rates of laparoscopy have dropped, but the incidence of metastatic dissemination hasn't changed. You know, so what's probably happening is they're getting treated, and what was maybe once a, a, a visible metastasis may have has responded in the peritoneum. We operate, and then we're surprised to get you know peritoneal uh, recurrence quite rapidly. So if we really are trying to do justice for our patients, we need to stage them. My opinion, as early as possible, but that's just how we do things. So Mark, let me let me push you on that a little bit. Um, if you take the 20% that are positive and follow them longitudinally, how many of them become radiographically positive after systemic therapy? In other words, you know, rather than doing them at diagnosis, why not re-image them after treatment and do laparoscopy prior to resection? So, you know, do you need to do that right off the bat? Will most of them will 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 they develop radiographically apparent disease if you just follow them longitudinally? Yeah, so we looked at the survival, both for those who had, you know, visible, and when I say visible, I mean laparoscopically visible, not imaging visible. Uh, there was no difference between those where we put a scope in and I saw an obvious met versus those that were peritoneal cytology only. They both had a median survival of 11 months, so they all did uniformly poorly as a group. Now there is a subset of patients who may have cytology positive only, but otherwise, you know, respond great to therapy and they always get pushed back to us. Uh, you know, we have a, a, a protocol for those patients, uh, you know, with high pack, et cetera, but that's a really, really select group of people. Uh, and, you know, we select those patients out. That's not something I would consider standard of care. Uh, do we repeat the cytology in those who are positive to consider for an actual resection? Uh, if it's a body tail lesion and just requires a distal, we possibly would, but a pancreatic head resection and some of the known peritoneal dissemination, that's not someone I would really consider. But again, you know, as therapy gets better and imaging gets better, everyone's going to be metastatic. It's whether we know it or not. So, anybody else? The timing of uh, diagnostic laparoscopy at your centers? Yeah, we we do it for most. I, I can't say that we do it for all, mm -hmm. uh, and we do it at the time of surgery. Um, there are a subset of patients, and Susan mentioned some patients that are particularly high risk for occult metastatic disease. And just to preserve my time and make things logistically easier on everybody, sometimes patients at a, a very high risk for occult metastatic disease, I'll do as a separate as a separate procedure, just so I don't kind of waste the day um, having the whipple on the schedule. That's a, that's been a no go. But generally, we do it just at the time of of uh, at the time of surgery. With respect to um, cytology, I know that a lot of people feel very strongly about this and um, have had a really good experience with it. I, I, I just got to be 
honest and say, you know, I used to do it. And when I did it, I had one patient that had one atypical cell of all the patients that I ever washed. So I don't know whether I'm not doing something right or my cytologist isn't doing something right, or I just got lucky, but it never, I, I could never find any positive cells. So I just stopped doing it. But I, I know that at some places, uh, maybe where they're very meticulous about either the acquisition of the fluid or uh, examination of the specimen, they, they have pretty high rates. So I, I, you know, I guess it's uh, surgeon and institution dependent to some degree. Yeah, we, we do laparoscopy selectively uh, prior to surgery, and we don't do cytology. Yeah. But that may change with time as more data accumulates. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Wei brought this up uh, in reference to the margins. There, Obviously, neoadjuvant therapy is increasing. And uh, Dr. Ma, there's, there's uh, questions from Dr. Washington and Dr. Moslem. Um, you know, we hold, we have these standards for lymphadenectomy and procuring a certain number of lymph nodes. And we know that neoadjuvant therapy affects, you know, not only the, the lymph node count, but the, the ratio. So how, how does that change in this, in this era? Well, I think you still have to, to harvest the same number of lymph nodes. Uh, we know that people who get neoadjuvant therapy oftentimes have a less incidence of lymph node positive disease. But in terms of adequately staging them, I think you know you still have to stick to the principles of doing the same thing uh, you would if it was a surgery first approach, harvesting 15 more lymph nodes from the the basins that we described. Um, you know those are the those are based on <clears throat> um, meticulous studies by the by the uh, Japanese Research Council um, that that really looked at the basins that are most at risk for tumor dissemination. And so you have to even, you know, if the lymph nodes look normal based on new agent therapy, you still have to take those lymph nodes out because those are the lymph nodes that are at risk for tumors most often going to those stations. Um, and so I, I, you know, whether you're doing a surgery first approach or new adjuvant approach, and hopefully these days most patients get new adjuvant, um, you would stick to the principles that were described. Yeah, we we looked at this to see, you know, sometimes you you know you do a standard dissection and you get three nodes. Another one, you get 50. Uh, we looked at it, and the number one predictor of how many nodes you got was which path technician was looking at your specimen. So find a good technician who has a lot of yield and make sure they do your specimens. I think that's probably the best. Yeah. But I mean, that's why we have standards, so they know how many lymph nodes they have to find. Do you, do you think yeah. that, um, that there was just a question about after neoadjuvant, they've seen lower numbers, and that you know has been consistently published. Those numbers are based off, you know, kind of the pre-neoadjuvant era. Do you think they'll change? I mean, 15 still seems like a reasonably low number. Just well, curious so your I thoughts. Think there's multiple reasons why you see less positive lymph nodes in uh, after neoadjuvant. The first is <clears throat> it's a select group of patients. The more aggressive biology patients are are progressing on neoadjuvant therapy and not getting to surgery. And two, there's downstaging from the chemotherapy right, and, right. and radiation that causes the lymph nodes to go away. But most of it is probably a selection that the patients who are positive also develop systemic disease and never get to surgery. So that's why you see a, a decrease in lymph node positive disease in those patients. I mean, right. I, think, I think they were also saying just numbers. a decrease in number. Yeah, yeah. just decrease. That, it's probably about quality of grossing. So, uh, and you know, there's a, with fibrotic changes and some of the changes that we see. So that's a lot of, you know, um, the way that we, I, I would expect that we, we shouldn't be changing the standards, at least at present. We may see over time, um, if there's more data to come out to support a lower uh, yield, but I suspect at this time, we still should aim for 15 at least. Yeah, and so they question should not to the group. harvest number. The, I mean, the group, you know, let's say your, your frozen says 10 nodes, are you gonna go back and pluck five more out? No, no, but I mean, this is where you need to no. have a team, you know, um, uh, collaboration with your pathologist so they know exactly the standard you're trying to achieve. Now, right. not, now some patients just don't have that many lymph nodes in the basins you, you, you take out. I mean, you know, we always, a good example is when we do bile duct resections, you know, there's supposed to be so many lymph nodes we take out and, and you'll go there and you skeletonize a port of hepatitis and there's like two lymph nodes that, you know, you end up with. So not every patient has all those lymph nodes, but you know, if you've done an adequate operation and you've had an ad adequate evaluation by the pathologist, then you shouldn't worry about going back and taking out more lymph nodes. You know you've done what you can. 
I mean, I, I, and, the, and the goal of the standard is that if your institution, you know, your median lymph node count is six for pancreatic or duodenectomies, and that's where something you'd have to look for quality improvement. If a single patient has 14 and another one has 50, that is sort of inpatient variation. But um, ultimately, at this time, uh, you know, we're not changing the, we, we shouldn't be thinking about changing the numbers. Now, whether the margin assessment may change with neoadjuvant, we don't know yet either, but you know, we all know that neoadjuvant can uh, change the appearance and change the final uh, read on the margins and also the lymph node positivity rate, not necessarily lymph node numbers. Is there value to um, whether it's uh, in your operative report or within the CAP protocol to specify specific stations that you remove these lymph nodes or that were that these stations were at least you know looked at? I actually send several of my margins separately. So I will send 8A separately, I'll send you know, 12 separately. So um, I just like to do that mostly for education purposes and for keep me sort of, a, um, you know, making sure that I'm looking at those lymph nodes. Well. But it, I don't send them like a bento box of all of the lymph nodes like they do in the, for gastric cancer. I don't know if anyone else here does. No, but I do think um, it's interesting because you know, we don't really know for, you know, like Sai talked about the N1 and N2 and all this. We, we don't really know the um, prognostic significance of specific N1 basins relative to each other. But, for example, we do know that aortic cable lymph nodes, um, uh, patients who have positive aortic cable lymph nodes have a survival that's basically equivalent to metastatic disease. I, I, I agree that that's not typically... Um, part of the dissection for pancreas cancer, but I, I personally occasionally do it, particularly when I have a patient that I'm trying to find a way out, um, you know, a really old or infirm who, you know, kind of is just on the border of, you know, kind of thing, and you're looking for a reason not to operate. Um, certain cases, you know, if they have a positive lymph node in the aortic cable region or in the hepatic arterial region, you know, they're reported as N1 disease, but it's really kind of M1 disease, right? So I think there's work to do educating our pathology colleagues about about the differences that uh, exist with respect to some of the lymph node basins. But in general, no, Alice, we, we also just kind of send it as a block. I do send my hepatic arterial lymph nodes separately, and I do send my aortic cable lymph nodes separately when I want to do an aortic cable lymph node dissection, for whatever that's worth. Um, Dr. Trudy, uh, oh, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I was going to say we had a, a few technical questions, so I'm just going to pick a couple because we're running out of time. But um, so a, a couple things about um, about your vein resections and, and your technique, and obviously we can open this up to the panel, as I know most uh, all of you do these operations. But um, a question about uh, size mismatch. So do you have any any tricks for when you have a significant size mismatch between proximal and distal? Um, and then what kind of suture line? Or are we talking interrupted running? Do you do a few different running? So I typically use 6-0 proline, you know, in a running fashion. And, you know, however way you're taught, you know, some people do 12-6. Other people do 3-9 and kind of, you know, rotate it around. Do the posterior wall, then the anterior wall. Uh, if you're doing a really long segment resection, then you are, by definition, uh, going to have a size mismatch. Your SMB is going to be quite small compared to your, you know, proximal portal. Uh, that's where uh, some of these autologous, you know, vein grafts uh, do have some benefit uh, because they have a natural taper to them. Uh, but oftentimes that distal is going to be often uh, mismatched. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you could take a little bit more, you know, a little bit less on the SMB, a little bit more on the graft to kind of bunch it. Uh, and then you just look at typically, you know, we use a lot of portal venous stenting. And if there's a big tight narrowing there, uh, we've intervened quite, you know, rapidly to, to put in a, a short segment stent to open that up to improve outflow if there's a significant stenosis. But yes, that can be a, a problem. You know, the further down you go and then it kind of bifurcate, you know, trifurcates mm -hmm. and yeah, you can't go any further. When you when you talk about stenting or using uncovered stents, covered stents, and then when that patient has a stent, you know, I mean, then the thrombosis risk, I would imagine, is significantly higher. Are they buying anticoagulation for life, or do you change your anticoagulation at that point? 
So uh, surprisingly, the, the thrombosis of the stent uh, is actually quite low unless there's an associated right. infection or fluid collection near it. Uh, so now, you know, they won't even consider putting a stent if there's any fluid that has to be drained because, you know, probably 50 percent of the time if there's an associated collection, they end up thrombosing. Uh, if we have to do it for, you know, emergent reasons, uh, then we do put them on agate coagulation. Uh, but in general, any vein resection at our center typically gets put on some sort of prophylactic anticoagulation. You know, they do the typical one month of, you know, uh, low molecular weight heparin, and then we put them on an oral, unless there's a significant stenosis and narrowing, then we put them on therapeutic. But that's just our practice. There's no hard data for that. Right. On the vein resection, are are you uh, assessing those margins intraoperatively? No. So I do send them, uh, but if they're positive, I'm not going to go redo the vein. You know, as I showed you some of the data, even those patients that had vein resections at all these major centers, there was still a higher rate of margin positivity. Uh, taking that little extra cuff of vein and now converting a good venous resection to a tenuous one isn't worth it. That just means they have so much extra pancreatic extension. Uh, you're not going to clear it. So those mm -hmm. are, that's kind of a bad prognostic indicator. So I, I leave it there. I don't re-resect. I don't know what the others do. I don't do a frozen section on the pan on the vein. Actually, the one thing that we don't do that we, um, and I'd be curious to what the panelists, do you pin your vein, right? Because what happens is you cut and it shrinks and then it gets, you know, who knows what the margin is when it gets grossed in the grossing room. But as everyone knows, it's not a great time to be pinning specimens in the middle of the vein reconstruction. But that's one thing I have thought is about marking the vein separately uh, uh, and, 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 uh, so that the margins are truly the margins. Yeah, they do tend to retract. You know, it's like cold weather, you know, mm -hmm. like the Seinfeld episode. But uh, yeah, I tend to put a suture there, you know, into the tumor to hold it there. That when I finally finish the recon, I go to path, I could find it again. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're never going to find it. No path tech is going to be able to understand the yeah. specimen you just gave them. Correct. Yes. Yeah, I, I think it's really important for these technical resections that you walk the specimen and go over it with the pathologist and orient the pathologist. Because I can tell you that if a technician gets it or a resident gets it, it's just unrec you know, unrecognizable in terms of the anatomy. And you know, you know, we we walk the specimen to our, our pathology lab and review it with a pathologist and they mark it and ink it right in front of us. And so we show them the vein, we show them the tumor vessel interface, uh, and they when we ink the specimen together. And that's actually one of the, the standards too in the cancer surgery standard textbook. So Yeah, yep. thanks for mentioning that, Sai. Um, okay, Dr. Trudy, uh, this was another technical question uh, asking about your indications for resection of the, the SMA. Well, that, okay. that's not a standard, so I'm not even going to bring it up here. The beehive. Separate, you want to send me an email, I'll, I'll give you a response to that, but this is, that's not considered standard of care at all. That's a different different webinar. Yeah, yeah. you bet. Exactly. Um, so I, I have kind of a larger philosophic question. So. You know the data on some of these is is sort of uh, mixed at best, uh, and so you know where do you guys think the line is drawn where you know the the pancre or the uh, tumor is extending along the duct, the tumor is extending into you know high nodes, the uh, tumor is extending to the SMA. You know at what point are we just fighting biology and and kind of how do we draw that line? Um, I think, you know, hopefully the book is it has drawn the line for us, but I was just curious if anybody has any closing thoughts on that as we uh, as we wrap up. I mean, I, I would say that we all need to remember that pancreas cancer is, is in most patients a systemic disease. And although we talk about these big operations, these big dissections and these technically demanding, you know, um, procedures that the future really is about understanding the biology, developing better systemic therapy. And two is patient selection. Um, and you know, the bet one of the best ways to select biology and select patients is utilization of new adjuvant therapy. And then once you select patients, doing the best operation you possibly can to give that patient a chance. 
Yeah, it's all this. I mean, we all do that, you know, currently. You have to have responsive disease. You have to have, you know, reasonably reconstructive, constructible anatomy. And you have to have a patient that will likely recover, you know, from whatever extent of that operation it is. So. Can can you can y'all give a little more specific about you know what's a good enough response right what are you looking for because you know often the CT doesn't change so are people using PET are they using 99 uh, you know are we just guessing Dr Katz is sort of smiling down there because it's another webinar we could talk for an hour it's another webinar too don't you think <laughs> yeah that's fair. Well, I guess just a practical for the community surgeons out there is everyone tracking 99 uh, and are using that to help you make decisions. You know, otherwise, what are you really making your decision on? Just a brief couple minutes. I mean, look, it's very clear the biomarkers that we're currently using are inadequate, right? Because we still see early progression, even in patients who have excellent response or have little tumors. Um, there are always patients that have early progression on the in, in the scan before they start adjuvant. I think the trouble with some of the biomarkers, it's hard to know what, what's the right response in CA99. Is it the rate of decrease? Is it the nadir? Is it sustainability? You know, all of those are sort of have to be integrated. So I don't know if there's a single one, you know, um, except I think I mean, we could probably all agree that routine CT scan reassessment after chemotherapy and radiotherapy is quite inadequate, right? So there, and I would like the opinion of others, you know, for patients particularly who are borderline, you know, what is the role of routine exploration in patients in whom uh, still have some soft tissue changes after chemotherapy and maybe we'll mix a bit of radiotherapy in there so we really can't tell what's going on. I, I don't know what uh, everyone else uh, will do in that situation. Um, and, and that's probably what you're sort of getting at, right, Tim? Dr. Breland? Yeah, I mean... Oh, Go sorry. Ahead, I was just going to say, I think it just depends on what kind of selection we're looking for, because I think obviously everyone wants to have a positive selection, so we're selecting the right people. But I think CA99 is very good for negative selection. So I think when the CA99 is going up, um, I think in very few cases, you know, that I've seen, the CA99 is rising and there's a really durable oncologic outcome in the future. I mean, I think that's something to consider, especially in the high-risk patient who is maybe frail or you have some other uh, comorbidity that you're worried about. I think, you know, that's a very helpful indicator for negative selection. Positive selection, I think, is much more complicated. Yeah, and I think the, the, the key thing I think we should advocate is as surgeons, we should be seeing these patients in follow-up. You don't just send them for neoadjuvant and they come back six months later because the oncologist has a different metric. Mets or no Mets, right? They got no Mets. They're high-fiving each other, even though they're CN99 tripled. You know, I mean, we're not, we're not looking for that. We're looking for a response. Okay, so that's the thing. We have to, to see them in conjunction with our medical oncology colleagues. You know, that's my biased opinion. I think that's well said. I think we're out of time. I could I could certainly keep this going for a while, from my opinion, but uh, we're being we're being told it's time to wrap it up. So I really appreciate all y'all's time. I think the talks were fantastic. Um, just for the the participants, you will get an email from the ACS. Uh, it'll describe a little bit of how you can get CME. You'll get a separate email about CME if you're after that. And then this will be posted on the ACS website. And then the ACS CSSP has its own YouTube channel that you can subscribe to, and this will be posted on that. It'll probably take a few weeks, but if you have trainees or you know partners or anybody else who you think could benefit from this, please spread the word. Um, it will be up on YouTube in a few weeks and, and everybody can uh, watch it there as needed. Um, anyway, just really, I think a great panel, great talks, and I really appreciate your time tonight. Appreciate everybody who tuned in and is watching as well. Yeah, great job, everyone. I learned a lot just listening to all your talks. So we all think we know a lot about this. We don't know much, but to hear all these experts, you know, to help me review all this data, that's super helpful. So thank you yeah, all for the hard work. Absolutely. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night.